So today I want to conclude our sermon series we've been looking at the last several weeks. If you've been here, you know the Lord's Prayer. And in the Lord's Prayer, it's amazing because the disciples go to Jesus and they want to learn how to pray. They don't want to learn how to preach. They don't want to learn how to start a church. They don't want to learn how to collect offerings. They want to learn how to pray because they know that if they can pray, prayer changes everything. Prayer turns the world upside down. And prayer can fix the problems in your life. Prayer is the most powerful tool that we have as Christians that oftentimes gets rusty and dull because we do not use it enough. If you are not praying, then my friends, my question is why not? Because you have the creator of all the universe, the heavens and the earth, right there listening to you. And I've had people say, well, pastor, I just can't pray like so-and-so. Well, you know what? We're not all going to pray the same. Some people have these long, lengthy prayers that sound like something out of a William Shakespeare novel. And others have prayers that sounds like something that came from Otis on the Andy Griffith Show. And I will tell you, it's not the way you are praying. It is the heart in which you pray. And so today, the good thing is is that when we pray, our Father who art in heaven, we are reminded we are in this together. We are reminded we are a family and we are reminded God is our Father. We are reminded that heaven is a destination that we are looking for. If you are setting up your kingdom on this earth, I hate to tell you this, but your kingdom is going to fall. It is only the kingdom of God in heaven that will last. So our Father who art in heaven, and then we remember we said, Hallowed be thy name. How many of us take the name of Jesus and when we speak it, we speak it in such a holy and sanctified way that others can see that we are bringing honor and glory to our Savior. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so in your daily life, when you clock in at work, Are you working as for the will of God? When you're raising your children, are you raising them kingdom children? You remember these statements that I've made in the last few weeks. Are you living a kingdom example and doing the will of God? We all can do better. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth that is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. The idea, God, we can't do it on our own. We need you in every aspect. Give us this day our daily bread. Are you praying God gives you your daily needs and using them? Give us this day our daily bread. And then the next part, we come to a conclusion. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And you remember last week, you have a cup of forgiveness that you can pour on anyone. And when you pour a cup of forgiveness on someone, God Almighty will refill your cup every single time. Forgive us our trespass, we forgive those who trespass against us. And then we see today, lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. And so today we're going to talk about temptation and being delivered from evil. And if we were to ask, and I will not ask you to embarrass yourself, but if we were to ask you as a people today, if you have been tempted this week, to raise your hand, and I would imagine all of us would raise our hands, and some would even probably shout out, Pastor, what are you talking about? I've been tempted in the last hour. Because we know temptation is not just a one and done, that the enemy is constantly wanting you to stumble and fall and to give in to sin. The Bible says the devil is there at your door waiting creeping, sneaking for you to open up and let him in, to devour you. And so when Jesus teaches the disciples to do what? As to pray this prayer about getting away from the temptation, lead us not to temptation and being delivered from evil. It is the grand idea that God is the shepherd and we are the sheep. God will not put you in temptation. But what we're praying for is that God, as a sheep of your fold, allow me to stay so close to you that I am led by you and not led into temptation. Some of us are led into temptation because we freely and openly jump at every moment the enemy 
has offered to us. Some of us are like a fish that whenever the fisherman throws in the hook, some of us are tempted when we see something flashy and we say, oh, I've got to have that. And we jump on every little thing that comes across us that might be flashy or get our attention. I want to let you know this is not everything that shines is gold and not everything that comes your way is worth what the world has to offer. It's just not worth it. And so some of us are like that. Others are so lured by the enemy is that when the hook of temptation drops into your life, you don't even care if it has bait on it. You just jump at it because it's something. Today I want to let you know is that God searches our hearts and if we genuinely do not want to be led into temptation, He will be there for us so that when we are on that path, He will speak and His sheep will follow Him. So let's turn today to the Old Testament. And I've given you several Bible verses in the bulletin. You'll notice 1 Peter 1.16, James 1.13, Psalm 139.24, 1 Corinthians 10.13, Psalm 141.4, Psalm 27.11, and Psalm 5, 8, all of these dealing with God leading us not into temptation. And here I want to start today by looking at Psalm 141. If you have your Bibles open, let's turn together to the Old Testament. The easy way to find it is about there in the center of your Bible. Psalm 141, and I want to just start with verse 1. This psalm is written by a man who knew what temptation was. His name is David. David, if you remember, was tempted... And given in to temptation so often. But yet it's amazing that even though David failed God. That David still in his temptation still knew to return to the shepherd. You see today it's not as much about you falling into temptation. But will you stay in temptation? Will you stay in the far country like the prodigal son? Or will you hear the voice of the father, the shepherd... And say, lead me not into that place. And so David writes in Psalm 141, Lord, I call on you, hurry to help me. Listen to my voice when I call on you. Notice David says that he is calling out on God. Why? Because when we are being tempted, we know we have an escape plan. We know that we have someone that we can turn to and say that I have got a temptation that's greater than I can handle. And Lord, I'm going to call on you. Sometimes when you're tempted, you might decide that I'm going to call my friends. But you have no clue. They might be friends that are part of that sin that you're tempted to do. And they will say to you, oh, it's okay. It's just a little bit of this or a little bit of that. You see, the only one that generally has defeated every temptation is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you turn to man to help you defeat the temptation, that man that you turn to might be struggling with the same thing. We must, yes, come together as sheep of his pasture, but we must listen to the voice of the shepherd who is Jesus Christ. It says, Lord, I call on you, hurry to help me, listen to my voice when I call on you. And in verse 2 it says, may my prayer be set before you as incense, the raising of my hands as an everlasting offering. The image here is in the Old Testament, they would actually burn incense. And the aroma, the smoke would go up. And when their prayers, they would actually visualize their prayers going up into heaven. You've seen where someone's burning something and the smoke goes up. This would have been a sweet smelling fragrance. If you can think about maybe like a Yankee candle or, or some of them other fancy candles that people will light. And the smell fills the room. And any of you that have ever lit a candle and you walk into a room and you smell that, you know there's something that's in there that's not normal. You, you recognize that. And that was the idea of the priests of the Old Testament is they would light this incense and the smell would fill the place. And I want to let you know is that when you pray, you might not see that prayer come out of your mouth. 
or fill your heart. But when you pray, that prayer is filling your space. And the temptation and the enemy cannot dwell in the same place that your prayer life is dwelling. Because what happens is that when you pray, you're allowing the work of God to move. And the light of God is breaking the darkness of sin. And so no matter the temptation you're in, if you will pray, that temptation can be edged out of your life. You say, Pastor, I do that. But the temptation keeps wanting to come back. And the reason why is because that temptation has to be fed. That enemy is like an wild animal. It wants to be fed on you. And so what do we do? We have to constantly live in the spirit of prayer. And then it says in verse 3, Lord, set up a guard for my mouth. Boy, I tell you, that, that's very powerful there, isn't it? David says, set something on my mouth so that before I open my mouth, Lord, that I won't fall into that temptation. You see, some of us are tempted whenever we are offended to correct the person who's offended us with our mouth. Let me say this to you. God is the greatest corrector of when you're offended. Let God deal with it. Now I know we get ir irritated and agitated and that's human. But he is saying God what comes out of my mouth. Don't let it draw me away from you. And then he continues. It says keep watch at the door of my lips. That is a daily prayer that all of us probably could benefit from. God put a guard on my mouth. And put watch over my lips. It says, do not let my heart, and here's the key verse, do not let my heart turn to any evil thing or perform wicked acts with men who commit sin. Do not let me feast on their what? Their delicacies. Lord, don't let me feast on what they have to offer. Because what they have to offer might look good. It might be sweet, but it's still deadly. You see, David says, Lord, do not allow me to be led into that way that I will commit sin. So Lord, if you see me and I'm drifting off from you, will you allow your Holy Spirit to convict me in such a way that as a sheep would look for his shepherd, that I would look for you and not be led into temptation. Folks, if you're struggling with a certain sin, and all of us struggle with different things. It might be anger. It might be lust. It might be greed. It might be envy. It might be gluttony. It might be whatever you think the sin could be. I will let you know this. Is that you can turn to God at any moment during that time of tribulation and temptation. And God loves you. And God will guide you out of that. He will. But oftentimes we are easy to be led into it, give into it, and then later have remorse. Friends, God can lead us away from this. It says that the enemy has a feast, but do not allow me to eat on that feast. Look at verse 4. Don't allow me to take part in it. You see, because sin, the Bible says in the New Testament, has pleasure. If you're wondering why your teenagers are acting the way they do, because they're enjoying the sin. And you don't have to be a teenager to enjoy sin, do you? Oh, no. You can be any age. You can be 100 years old and enjoy sin. But it says that sin only has pleasure for a short period of time, for a season. You see, it's just like any tree that's bearing fruit. During the time it's bearing fruit, guess what happens? You eat it, you enjoy it. But there will come a time that the tree, the leaves will die, and the fruit will rot. But what we have failed to learn as believers in Jesus Christ is when we eat off of that tree of sin, like Adam and Eve who ascend against God, we need to understand is that as we would not eat rotten fruit with maggots and bugs and, and decay and grossness, I mean, think about that. You wouldn't buy, eat into that. But you need to look at sin that way. Sin is the artificialness of what God has to offer. God has to offer every couple that's married a special bond that only husband and wives should be doing. 
The what does sin do? Sin leads us astray into lust and says, oh, it's fine. Anyone can do it. Maybe you might be thinking to yourself, oh, I enjoy to rest. And there's nothing wrong with rest. But temptation is, is when we become lazy and we become slothful. And maybe you enjoy other things in life. Did you know that everything in this world, Satan has done his very best to pollute and destroy? And you, my friends, and I, we do not have to fall into that trap. And so when we feast on what God has to offer, it will last. But if we feast on what Satan has to offer, it will kill us and destroy us. There's a little secret that you might not know. But if you go and study how the rat poison company gets away with what they make, and why would a rat or a mouse eat rat poison, it's simply this. They make it where it tastes sweet. If they made rat poison where rat poison was horrible and it, it had the worst odor to it, then what effect would it do? None, right? But if a rat poison smelt good to the rodent, if it tastes good, they're going to want to eat it and consume more of it, not knowing what will happen. Eventually, they're going to die. How many of us know that while we are participating in sin, it might affect our senses? You know, that's what Satan's doing. He's affecting our senses of taste, smell, hearing, touch. But even though you might find pleasure in it, what will it lead to? It'll lead to death. And so we see that. We saw that with Adam and Eve. It says, if you take part of the tree, you'll surely die. No, they did not drop dead at that point, but spiritually they did die. David, when he watched Bathsheba taking a bath, David was not her husband. She was married to another man. And yet David, he does not run from temptation, but it says that he gave in to temptation. What about Samson? You remember the great judge of the Old Testament. It says that he was persuaded to lay down his head on the lap of Delilah. And Delilah would take her hand and she would rub his long hair. And she's like, oh, your hair is so beautiful and, and you're so strong and, and wonderful. Tell me, what is the secret of your strength? And he made up a few things just joking. And every time he joked about what it was, you know, tie me up with rope or do this, that, or the other. And she'd get mad and say, now, Samson, why are you lying to me? And people would bust in and try to have him killed. And Samson just want the brightest or the sharpest knife in the drawer, I don't think. Uh, because he finally gave in to her. He gave in to temptation. And he told her what his strength came from. And the moment that happens, what takes place? His hair's cut. He is held into, as a hostage. He is treated. His eyes are plucked out. He is treated like a circus animal. And then finally one day, his hair, he realizes, has grown back. And he prays to God. He says, just one more time, Lord. Just one more time. Give me my strength so that I can honor you. And it's amazing he does that, and God honors him in that request. But Samson would have never been standing there treated like a government mule, blind, and sitting there being mocked and ridiculed if he had not given in to temptation. But thanks be to God, he still realized that he could turn to God even in that sense of, I'm standing here blind, I've been being laughed at, but I can still turn to God and say, God... I need you. I need you. What you can do as a parent, let's just bring this home. You need to instill in your child's life that when they do give in the temptation, that not only can they return to God and seek Him out, but you need to be the kind of parent that says this, regardless of the sin that you get involved in, I will love you because God loves you. Come home. Have an open door policy to come home to that child. Any of you that ever had children understand some of the hurt, most hurt ways that you have been hurt is by that child that was disobedient. Any of you ever been hurt by your children or grandchildren or hurt by a family member? I will say this to you is that when they fall into temptation, be the one that can offer forgiveness and love to them. Because how many of you are glad today that when you fell into temptation, 
that you had a loving person. Maybe you didn't have it in your family, but you had a loving person named Jesus that still welcomed you back and said, I know that you fell into the pig pen of sin like the prodigal son, but I welcome you back and I love you and you can be redeemed. You see, it is not the temptation, but it's the staying in the temptation, giving in to the temptation, and remaining there in the far country that will destroy us. Let's continue now. Let's look over to Psalm chapter 5, verse 8. We'll stay in the book of Psalm just for a moment. Psalm 5, verse 8. David is writing here again. Notice how many times David talks about this. In verse 8 it says, Lord, lead me in your righteousness. Are you praying, God, lead me a certain way? Because human nature, we're going to go and follow things that are not beneficial to us. Have you ever had a cat and you've seen where you take those little laser pointers and you do it on the ground and that that cat or whatever animal, they'll jump at that little light and think they're going to get it. And, then, and you just laugh. You think, it's, oh, it's so funny. You run it up on the wall. You can, do it. you can tell I've had fun doing this. <laughs> and you watch the animal just going berserk over it. You can do it in circles until finally the owner of the cat comes in and says, what are you doing with my cat? And then you have to put your laser pointer up. And so you see that. Now just imagine in your mind. Don't you know Satan is having just the best old time in the world doing us and we're like that old cat. There ain't nothing Satan can offer you. That little laser light, that cat can get hold of it every time. And guess what? He still hasn't got hold of nothing. And some of you, that it, some of you right now, I can sense in my spirit, you're like, Oh yeah, Satan has got me like that before. He put that laser on the liquor store and I went to the liquor store. He put the laser on another man's husband or another man or another. Well, today, <laughs> y'all laugh at that, but that's the way we are, isn't it? Huh? I know it's a, Fro a Freudian slip, but that's the truth. Come on. He put the laser on someone else's spouse. That's a better way of wording it. I'm sorry, when you up here, you're just preaching like a country folk, so, okay? He put the laser on something, and you're like, why did, I try, why did I flirt with that other person's spouse? Right? Does it make sense? He puts the laser on things on the internet that we shouldn't be looking at, and then when we get done looking at it, we think to ourselves, why did I just look at that mess? He puts the laser on something for us to get mad about. Any of you ever just turned like the Hulk and got mad over some of the dumbest mess? And when you're done getting mad, you're like, why did I do that? It's because Satan is putting a laser on these things, that laser light, and when we get hold of it, we realize, why? But you know, that's where the Holy Spirit has to convict us. I know an individual right now who has the most terrible time lying. They lie about everything it seems like. And every time that I try to work with this individual and mentor them and minister to this person about lying, it seems a lot right when you've got a breakthrough, but they go back and lie again. And it's over some of the dumbest stuff in the world. But you know what? God knows exactly what the enemy's going to tempt us with but the enemy also knows that we've got a God that's not going to give up on us. Are you getting that? God knows what the enemy's going to do, but the enemy knows what God has already done. Let's continue. Go to Psalm, if you will, 27, verse 11. Psalm 27, verse 11. We're almost done. Because of my adversaries, show me your way. So the writer here is David again. And he says, because I've got enemies, show me the way I should go. Don't lead me towards my enemies. Lead me away from it. Deliver me from evil. But it says in that verse 11, it continues, it says in 2711, it says, Lord... And lead me on a what kind of path? A straight path. Level path. Straight is the way to the kingdom of God. Narrow is the way. 
And there's a way to ask God to lead us in that path. You know yourself, there's only one way to God. His name is Jesus. You know yourself that God Almighty will never abandon His children. He will never do that. But you also know how easy it is for His children to abandon Him. I'm going to wrap it all up and want you to just think of this. How many of you have given in to temptation? Every one of us. We're human. At some point in time, from the time you took your first cry in the hospital or wherever you were born, to this very second on this Sunday morning, every one of you have been tempted. Some of you have been tempted, and because of your awakeness in the Lord, your alertness on the path you're on, you were able, because of Christ, to overcome that temptation and be delivered from evil. Some of us, though, and all of us probably have been tempted and we took our eyes off of the shepherd. The shepherd was right there with his sheep the whole time. And the shepherd was leading us in a narrow and straight path. Now on the sides of us was destruction. If you ever go to Israel, it's mighty amazing to see the shepherd and their sheep. They can go right on the edges of a cliff or in certain areas. And I've watched this with my own eyes in Israel and seeing that shepherd with his sheep, and the sheep will be right there. They know his voice, and he'll call to them, and they'll come and follow him. But if a sheep wants to be disobedient, if they go one way or the other, they could simply fall to their death. They could be hurt. They could be injured. Why? Because they were led away by their own enticing. Today the question is, Are you listening to the voice of the shepherd? Are you watching what Jesus Christ has you to do? Are we praying, dear God, do not allow us or even permit us to be tempted to sin? Because Lord, you know me. I will sin. You can say that to the Lord. Lord, you know me. And you know how easy it is for me to give in to sin. Folks, none of us in here are perfect, are we? If you say you are, then there will be an altar call in just a few minutes. We're not perfect, but we do have a perfect Savior that redeems us. Jesus told us to pray, and we should do this. This request implies that God has such control over the one who tempts us as to save us from His power if we just simply call upon our Heavenly Father. Amen? God is more powerful than the temptation you're going to have. Today, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you are following your own lusts and desires, I will say this to you. You might not think you need Jesus because you have got a good home, Your family life is going well. Your job, it seems like you just got a promotion. Everything in life seems like it's just just you're floating on in cotton. And everything's great. But you know, at the end of the day, something's going to happen. That the new home, the job, the family, the new car, all of that will not help you when you're on your deathbed. Because you might have given to temptation for your entire life and never accepted the call of the great shepherd. None of those things you have. Death does not bargain with you because you live in the country club. Death does not bargain with you because you drive a new model car. Death will not bargain with you if you have a full bank account of money. Death will still come and take you. And when it does take you, it will take you to a place of eternal punishment. Because the wages of sin is death. And if I stopped there, it would seem mighty dark, wouldn't it? But I can't stop there because as a minister to the gospel, I have to remind you of the final part of that text. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God for those who will simply listen to the voice of the shepherd. And when temptation calls you, think of this, temptation calls you, you'll listen more to the voice of Jesus instead of the voice of the tempter. This morning, you've got voices all around you, do you not? 
don't you? Amazing thing is to go into a store as a child and get lost. Any of you ever done that? Had a child go in the store and get away from you? I did that several times with my grandparents. And it wouldn't take but one time my granddaddy to say pretty good and loud my name. And I knew it was him. He didn't even have to call me by my full name. He could just say, son. Son, where are you? Well, there was other people's sons around. But I knew it was his voice because I'd spent enough time with my grandfather to know it was him that was calling me. Folks, is the Savior calling you right now to get away from the temptations and the evil that is right there with you? You will leave here today, Miss Cindy, come on. You will leave here today either listening more to the voice of the enemy or you will listen to the voice of the Savior.